welcome to another session of Change Leadership Conversations. Today I have with me Rich Batchelor. He is the president and chief change agent of Capillary Consulting. He's also the founding president of ACMP Toronto, which is Association of Change Management Professionals Toronto. He was their founding president for six years. And that was how I met Rich, actually, as the president of ACMP. And just about when we were starting the Change Leadership organization and Rich was ever so supportive. So Rich has been a supporting partner for the change leadership since we started. And not only has he been a supporting partner, he's also been a friend. So welcome, Rich. Thank you. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> I'm excited to have you. I'm really excited to have you. So Rich, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Sure. Um, so what do I do? I do so many things. I'm constantly busy, um, as you well know, with things. But everything I do is anchored in the change space. Mm-hmm. You know, I do some teaching at schools and colleges locally. But my primary thing it comes through my own business where mm-hmm. I focus on consulting, coaching and education learning activities through that um, with an anchor in the change space. When I describe what I do, I find it interesting because... I've kind of morphed some of the words that I use. I kind of describe myself as doing change enablement, maybe more than just change management or change leadership, because I think the work I do is enabling individuals and organizations to go through change successfully. Mm -hmm. And that employs successful strategy, leadership, organizational development, change activities, I'm working with the people. I, I love working with people to make this thing happen. So that's my primary thing. Most people who are in the change space as professionals love people first. People first is a big thing. And which I would say is the foundation of all of the changes we go through. Change doesn't happen in a vacuum. It takes having to change people's behavior. I will not say change people, but change people's behavior. And that's what it's all about. Talking about change, we have not experienced this type of change that we are going through right now as a global nation. (laughs) I say global nation because not just a nation of Canada where we're both based, but globally, we're all experiencing this type of change. And I want to hear a little bit more about you. What's your take on the changes we're experiencing at the moment? Yeah, it, it's such a, a catalyst for so many things that's happening in the world at the moment. I, and I like your use of the phrase change is affecting the world as a nation because we've become so used to connecting as a world. I Myself, I work all over the world as I think you've done connections all over the world with stuff and we're so used to having that ease of being able to go around and do things and all of that's come to a stop. But to to link it back to the whole, whether you call it psychology, mindset, behavior, the way people are feeling about this is fascinating Mm. because it's been such a a hard shock to the system for so many people. We talked a little bit about things like Kubler-Ross curves and stuff like that um, in the past. And it's really evidencing that fact that this impacting people has become quite a shock for a lot of people. Um, Mm. But it's also been a developmental opportunity for so many people as well, because I hear and I talk with so many people who've been, oh, well, I was going to do the online thing when I got a chance to do it, but I've never had the chance to do the online thing. Well, now they have a chance to do the online thing. Or my job I never thought could be done in a virtual world. Well, maybe now I'm finding it can be done in a virtual world. So I I think there's also that kind of revolution versus evolution piece that's coming in as well. It's a bit of a revolution in the way that we deal with the working world, but it's also helping our evolution as um, humanity to to embrace a much broader spectrum. You know, we need to kind of realize that we're a much bigger space and there's so many more opportunities. But I also recognize that people are hurting. And I think that's that's key as well to recognize. And different people are hurting at different levels at the moment because yeah. you've got the space of how their life has been turned upside down. People have lost income sources. People are having to struggle to change what they can actually do to look after family, households, whatever it may be that they have responsibilities for. 
So I think we also have to be reflective that even though there's all this behaviour change, there's also a, a feelings focused hurt and pain that people are going through as well with all of this. And for some people, that's a lot harder and sharper than for other people as well. Yeah, I love the fact that you took a second to acknowledge and help us realize that people are going through this change in different ways. And some people are going through just income loss. Some people are going through the grieving of a close family friend or even their family member or someone they knew. Some people are grieving the loss of a job. There's all types of grief going on, which takes me to also talking about the Kubler-Ross curve, which you referenced earlier. Could you tell me a little bit more about it or your take on it? I mean, I have my take on it and we've spoken about it a little earlier, but can you share with all of us your take on it and what that looks like? Yeah, I, I'm, and it's interesting with the Kubler-Ross curve because obviously its origins are dealing with death and loss. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively what we are dealing with at the moment is the loss of sometimes unfortunate people because it is an unfortunate situation health wise on that front. But we're also dealing with the loss of what we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And as we go across that curve and, you know, you go through, you know, there's a few variations, but typically you have that kind of, you know, you have the shock moment of coming to the the situation and then you go through the kind of trying to reason it, you sort of self-questioning and kind of maybe even arguing a little bit with yourself before you get maybe a bit more vocal and externally arguing. Then you kind of come to terms and stabilize to a certain extent before you can embrace and accept um, moving forward. Uh, and I find myself, I've kind of, I quickly went through that first piece when this came along and said, okay, I'm accepting this. I can embrace this. Let's find out how I can work with it rather mm. than work against it. Back from the point that I mentioned before about different people at different stages and different situations responding, there are still some people who are regularly still going through those early shocks. They're like, oh, my word, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and oh, I can't do that. And they're still in that kind of feeling pushed back and hard um, done by with the whole situation um, and they're struggling to come to terms with that and I think you know well, I, I'm I, I'm very confident we'll talk about the leadership stuff in this in, in a moment <laughs> but it does come into that reflection of leadership qualities that some of us who are maybe further along that curve have a responsibility towards those that are further behind them to help and support them and rationalize and also recognize and say it's okay to not be okay about this Mm. we're not expecting everybody to be at the same space on this everybody has different points along those lines that they're going to be on some people move quickly some people move slowly one of the other sort of uh, models methods whatever you want to call it is um bill bridges william bridges model where he talks about the letting go then a neutral zone, and then actually embracing the new. And I find it fascinating that so many people are comfortable with letting go of the old way at this moment, but they're actually stuck in neutral because they haven't really embraced the new thing so much. And how much time they're going to spend in that neutral zone is reflective of linking it to that kind of Kubler-Ross curve of where they are on the Kubler-Ross curve. You know, it's interesting that we talk about these models and methodology we've brought to up incidentally i say incidentally because <laughs> i didn't think I I was <laughs> this conversation talking about models but that's why we're having a conversation anything can come up but in a time of crisis such as we're going through and disruption is there really any time to even use things like this models or let me change the question There is time to always use models because models are always based on principles. But change is happening so fast. And like a quote I heard recently, or I say recently, not too long ago, it says that change has never happened at a faster pace than it's happening today. And it will never slow down. Mm -hmm. It will never be this slow. It's only going to get faster. So what kind of world does that leave us in where we are in constant change? How do leaders begin to lead through this constant change where before someone can get comfortable with the new change, there's another change coming in? And just even look at where we are with the pandemic. Some of us are still 
trying to embrace it and determine what it means for us. Some of us have embraced it already and it's become a new normal <laughs> for, <laughs> for some of us. But before we say Jack Robinson, the pandemic is going to be over and we're going to be going through some other cycle again of going through changes. So what do you say to leaders who have to lead in such an uncertain world? Yeah, and it, it, it's fascinating because before this came along, the actual world, you know, I, I often make the comment like, there's only three things you can guarantee in life, death, taxes, and change, because they, they've always there. Um, and interest in the velocity of change has been increasing with all technological advancement. And, you know, we often talk about the, the fourth industrial revolution and all that sort of side of things that people can look up and, and look into. Um, but it is important that we recognize that this disruption is actually going to probably be just one of many that we're going to be navigating as we go forward. There's a, a phrase that some people might have heard of that I use quite a lot and I spent the last couple of years talking about, which is the VUCA situation. And VUCA is a, an acronym that stands for Volatility, Uncertainty, Complexity and Ambiguity. And it's a, a kind of nice way of describing the disruption and the unpredictability, the the way we are, the way we're dealing with things that are just like unknown. And we can't do that nice sort of, you know, old school project plan Gantt chart that says, tick this off when this is done, tick this off. We're having to be responsive and uh, react to things as they happen. And for me, that gives me some sort of, thought process towards developing leadership for the future and what people need to be leading through change in the future is the ability to be much more agile. And I mean, being agile, not doing agile. I'm not talking about agile project processes, software development, that sort of stuff. I mean, more in terms of that flexibility, that nimbleness about us. We need to be recognizing that We can't predict so easily every small detail of what's going to be happening. We need to recognize that as we move forward, as leaders in society supporting people, we need to be demonstrating and leading by example our own agility and nimbleness because those are the traits that we need to be supporting in other people. But on top of that, we then also need to be looking at their peace of mind, the individual's challenges you know i mentioned pain and hurt just now with people go through with this sort of constant ever increasing change and it's important for that that people build resiliency and i think it's really key for people to recognize that um, as individuals we have to have a an element of self-reflection and knowledge of how much can i cope am i at that level am i at that level am i at that level Where, where do i sit in my own level of resilience and I define resilience as being that sort of capacity to to flex back when things are thrown at you whatever that thing might be that comes your way and I would like to see organizations through leadership actually encouraging more organizations to build resiliency practices and even plans as part of their employee well-being plans they just a general people plan in the organization should include elements of, you know, allowing people to build their own resiliency levels and encouraging people to be more agile within the workplace through demonstrated leadership. And I think the resiliency piece is also an element where leadership needs to be demonstrating and leading by example, because far too many leaders work every hour that they can possibly do and they sacrifice their personal life and they just burn themselves out too quickly. Whereas in actual fact, we need to learn to step back, breathe. I've been talking a lot recently with the the elements of um, breathing, doing the the four fours, where you actually breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, and do it four times. And that just gives... (laughs) Was out for four seconds? (laughs) So four seconds in, hold for four seconds, out for four seconds. That was even just relaxing for just a second. <laughs> and just doing that four times helps you to mentally make a mind break between whatever's happening to you at that point in time. You know what? The thought of just breathing in, holding in and exhaling 
it's just so relaxing. And you talking about resiliency, I know you have a free course on your website on resiliency, building resiliency and managing change. And we'll share that with anybody listening and they can go check it out. And I want to take you a step back to VUCA. Yeah. Definitely in a VUCA world. It's volatile. (laughs) It's uncertain and it's very, very complex. How do people start to prepare to lead in a VUCA type of world? Because leadership is not something that you suddenly start developing when you experience changes like this. Leadership is something that you prepare for to lead this type of change. And in a change leadership, what we are big on is preparing leaders and empowering them to lead and drive change in today's disruptive business environment. Is this a wake-up call for organizations and leaders to start thinking, I need to develop my people with change leadership skills and other kind of needed skills to be agile, like you mentioned, and to develop organizations that are resilient. What's your take? Yeah, absolutely. And I like your phrase of like wake up call, because I think it is a little bit of, you know, wake up, open your eyes to the way things are. We have to recognize that leading change is not just the responsibility of those at the top of the tree in any organization. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's responsibility. Everybody can demonstrate leadership. It's not a positional title to be a leader. Being a leader is that person inside the team who is comfortable sharing their thoughts and encouraging others to develop themselves and being willing to be people-focused. You know, I, I often say that, you know, you... You manage tasks, but you lead people. Mm. And it's very much a case of where the whole notion of leadership in organizations, people need to be encouraging organizations and the staff in organizations to be demonstrating core skills around comfort with looking at the outside and the inside of their space. It's Mm. not just about being so narrow-minded that the only thing that matters is the buttons you tap in front of you. It's seeing where the channel goes to that. How does it affect everybody else around me? How do I actually happen to engage with those people? So I think those sort of elements and, you know, communication skills are tremendously important. But we have to remember it's not just about communicating. It's communicating in the right way and making sure that we're talking about the right things using the right language that's understood. And that can happen for anybody in any conversation they have in. I like that. It can happen for anybody at any point. And one of the things about change leadership being important as a skill for everybody is that in such an agile world, an agile environment where we have to respond very quickly to change, in Mm. a situation that we're experiencing now, people have had to respond very quickly. And the leader with the position as leader of the organization, cannot be everywhere at every given point in time. So it's more important that you equip your team to be leaders. You equip Mm -hmm. them to be able to respond to change because you are not going to have that capacity to do every single thing. However, if your team members are equipped as change leaders, they're more able to work alongside you to lead and drive the change that they're experiencing. And this isn't, to me, a mindset only for the leaders themselves to say they want to equip their team members as change leaders. It's also for all of us to have that mindset that we want to be change leaders. It's interesting, when I speak to some people about change leadership, they say, "Mm, it's it's not for me. (laughs) I can't really do anything from the middle. Change leadership or leading change is just for the people at the top. They don't see themselves as change leaders. And some people who see themselves as change leaders, they struggle to say, how can I lead change from the middle? Yeah. And I think you raised some points there in terms of how that can be done. And I think that's really key because I think there are some misconceptions that leading change, demonstrating change leadership is about old school directional command and control, barking out orders to people. It's not, that's long gone. To truly demonstrate that leadership is somebody who can 
nurture others to go forward with things, influence, support, um, inspire people. You know, I think inspiration is a big leadership quality that people who can demonstrate that ability to, you know, recognize and be trusted by other people for what they know and what they can do. Those are all key qualities. Okay. And before we go, I want to ask you a question around what everybody's saying, the new normal. <laughs> do you think that there is going to be a new normal post-pandemic, post the lockdown? What do you see as the new normal once this lockdown is over? So I'll, I'll come at this in a few different ways because okay. actually the new normal is an irritating phrase for me. <laughs> because, um, I knew you were going to be friends. <laughs> I knew you were going to push back on that term. <laughs> Um, but it's because it suggests that after this, we'll go back to a stable environment, that there'll be something that's quite easy and clear and boxed. And we can say that. And I don't think we do. Well, I actually don't think we have been doing that for some time to what I was just talking about. But I think there will be a new normality of mindset mm. rather than a new physical normal, should we say. And I think that new normality of mindset is going to be people recognizing the multiplicity, the, the breadth of opportunity that's out there to use things virtually and physically and blended together. But I also think as well from a, an organization and a business point of view, I think we're finally broken through that um, barrier where certain organizations and individuals, certain organizations saw this as job for life. And this security piece, I think, and I get that it's going to be hurtful and painful for a lot of people. But I think that one of the biggest things is that we're going to see a much more transient and mobile workforce that people work on actions deliverable in jobs rather than having so many. I started off as this point in the organization and 27 years later, I'm at this point in the organization. It's going to be more about I've done this job for this period of time, then I've done this, then I've done this, then I've done this, then I've done this. And maybe it's increasing levels of responsibility, but not all caught up in the same organization. I see it as I've done this now, and now I'm here, and then I go up, and then here, and call. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's going to be horizontal. It's not just vertical, or almost even going like a line, yeah. of, you know, but going across different industries and sectors and just being nimble. Which reminds me of a book I read called Polymath, which talks about diversity in terms of our skills and specialization no longer being mm -hmm. key for the now. It's all about the diversity and being able to do different things, which is really key. What final word would you leave for our viewers, listeners, audience, anybody listening to you right now? So... My, my final thought would be to embrace curiosity. And I throw the curiosity word out there because I think this is something we need to be doing is being comfortable in questioning, being comfortable in asking what this means to me, what this means to you, what this means to everybody else. And I think as we go forward, great comfort can be taken from curiosity because it helps you to understand what's going on and it helps you to understand what's going on and as it means to you. So don't be afraid to ask a question. We're in a space now where nobody's going to judge people for asking questions. Mm, mm. And I'm just going to leave you with that final word because you raised something which I wanted to now talk about again. And I know if I start, we're not going to end. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not even going to go there. If anybody wants to know what my thoughts were or curiosity, send me a message, ask me a question, and I'll tell you what it is. But now I'll just leave you curious about what my following was going to be. But Rich, if anybody wants to reach out to you, connect with you a little bit more, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm always happy to connect with people and talk stuff and as as we do, you know, with these sort of conversations. So reach out to me. You can um, contact me through the company website. So rich at capillaryconsulting.com. So the website is capillaryconsulting.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter regularly. 
uh, Rich Bachelor and also LinkedIn Rich Bachelor. And it's an easy name to remember. So <laughs> hopefully the Rich Bachelor time that you've spent today is something that helps you to remember. Yes, it is. And I wanted you to really share how they can connect with you because on your website, they can also find out about the free online course that's absolutely here which is on resiliency and managing change so would love for people to check that out as usual thank you rich for being part of our conversations today and i'm sure we will continue to converse more about this we do have you for one of our master classes coming up that was postponed as a result of this on diversity and inclusion as a tool to driving change so looking forward to that one as well where we will geek out some more <laughs> So till next time, bye everybody.